In this lesson, we'll look at the timer module. This module provides what I would call very basic functionality. And there are lots of areas for enhancements, and we'll talk about some of these at the end of the lesson. Now, the timers work using a callback or handler function. That means when the timer expires, a function of your choosing is called. These timers have one millisecond resolution. This is not spectacular, but it's good enough for many uses. These timers are based on the one millisecond system tick interrupt. But the callbacks run in the context of the super loop. In other words, they are not called from interrupt context. The timer module is a singleton, but it manages many independent timers. So a better name for the module might be timer manager. The timer operations are pretty typical. So as a timer user, you first get or create a timer. Normally you specify a callback handler. You don't have to. Then once you have the timer, you can stop, start, and restart it. And you can release the timer. The timers are essentially in a pool. So you get a timer, it takes it from the pool, you release it, it puts it into the pool. A timer can be automatically restarted based on the callback return code. And this is how you would create periodic or repeating timers. The timer module supports several commands, which we will look at in a little bit. And the timer module also provides the system tick value, which is one millisecond granularity. This tick value is an unsigned 32. And that means, if you do the math, it will roll over every 49.7 days. By the way, as an aside, if you are careful on how you do elapsed time calculations, you usually don't have to worry about rollover. Here we see the major interactions between the timer module and others. So below the timer module is the command module, which is here because the timer has some console commands. So on startup, the timer module registers those commands, and then if someone enters those commands, the command module will call the uh, timer, the command handlers. And then the other interaction is just between the timer and its clients. So um, typically the clients will call timer operations like get a timer or stop a timer, and when the timer expires, the callback will be made. Let's look at the timer API in the header file. The first thing I want to show you is this enum. And this is what the timer callbacks return. And the key one here, the interesting one, is this value, um, callback restart. And what that will do is cause the timer to be restarted with the same timeout value as before. And this is how you would create repeating or periodic timers. Here is the timer callback signature. And you can see that it, the arguments in that callback are the timer ID. Not sure how useful that is, but it's included. And then some user data, which the, the user specifies when they um, created the timer. You can see that there, is, there are no timer uh, configuration parameters at the moment. Here are the three or three core API functions. Here is an additional API that returns the timestamp in units of milliseconds that I just mentioned uh, on the previous slide. And then here are the instance level APIs, so working with particular timers. And the first two are ways of getting or creating a timer. Um, in the one case, you specify a callback function and callback data, and in the other function, you don't. It creates the timer, but there is no callback. These remaining um, uh, APIs are used to, to operate on a timer that has been um, gotten or created. So 
Start allows you to start uh, or even restart a timer or stop one, in fact. Um, the release is to put the uh, timer sort of back in the pool. You're done with it. And then timer instance is expired checks if the timer is expired. If you don't have a callback, that's what you would mainly use. You, would, you could check every time your run function um, is entered, for example, to check if the timer is expired. So that's it for the API. So now let's look at the timer module implementation. And I'll show you just a few things. This is the states of a particular timer, and it's pretty simple. A timer can be unused, which means it's in the pool, and then it could be stopped, running, or expired. This is the complete information about a particular timer. It includes the state we just looked at, but it also includes time values, the callback function, and the callback user data. Here is an array of those timers uh, as a variable. This is essentially the timer module state. Here is the tick value, the one millisecond tick value. That is um, the basis of the timers. Uh, here, are, here is information about the console commands that get um, provided to the command module on uh, start. Here are the uh, core APIs, timer init, timer start, that aren't terribly interesting. Here's timer run, which is the interesting um, API. And I want to show you just a few things in here. In Here, here is a key uh, statement just for performance. The super, lap, super loop might run very, very fast, whereas timers can, you know, things happen on a one millisecond boundary. So what it does here is checks if the time, the current time in milliseconds is the same as the last time, um, it just immediately returns. It doesn't have to look to see if any timers have expired. Then the rest of this goes through every timer in the array. This is not terribly efficient and basically checks if that timer has expired. And if it is, if it has, it calls the callback. Well, if there's a callback. Uh, function defined, it makes that callback right here. And if the callback returns uh, callback restart, then the timer module sets up that timer to run again. Uh, so here is the API that just returns that, uh, that tick counter. And then these are the per instance uh, timer APIs. So this one gets or, or creates a timer instance. And here is another variation of getting or creating a timer. And then here's the API that can be used to start or stop or restart a timer. Here's timer instance release to put it back in the pool. And then finally, here's the API used to check if a timer is expired. Now this is important. Um, this SysTick handler is called from the SysTick handler in the generated code. You may remember we put a hook in there from the generated code SysTick handler to call this one. And all this does is increments that uh, tick counter. And that's what drives the timers. So below here are some utility functions. There are also the command handlers for the console commands. And I believe that's about it. This is, by the way, is a timer callback that's used as part of the timer test command. So I want to show you just a few things on the console. First, we can find the commands um, that the timer module supports. And the interesting ones are the uh, status and the test command. So the status command prints any timers that are active. And there are two. Um, one of these is being used for Blinky. 
and I and the other one is being used for the GPS module. Um, and if I print the status several times in a row, you can see uh, timer one uh, counting down. This this is the time left before it expires, and you can see it counting down. Now this is a repeating timer, so as, as soon as it expires, it it instantly starts running again. Then the timer test command allows sort of unit testing and just playing around with this. So what I'm going to do is use this first command uh, and get a timer. So this, the usage is timer, test, get, and then milliseconds. I'm going to say 20 seconds. One, two, three. The operation returned a 2, which would be the timer ID. So now, if we enter timer status, we see our timer, and we see that it has, it's, well, it has 12 seconds left. So I'm going to see if I can catch it before it expires. Uh, it's, well, it's down to 1.2 seconds, and now there's no time left, and you see that the state has went to expired. So these are the kind of things we can do on the console with timers. As I mentioned before, this timer implementation is pretty basic. It might be good enough for some embedded apps, but you might need something better. So here are a few possible enhancements, and this is just based on what I have seen and what I have done in my career. First, you might have noticed that the code did a brute force search through, through the timer array looking for expired timers. This is fine if you have a handful of timers, but when you scale up to larger numbers, this could become a bottleneck. Often, timers are put on a linked list in the order of expiration to make this process more efficient, and people have all sorts of ideas of how to do timers efficiently. You might have also noticed that the number of timers is set at compile time. There is a hash define. It is sort of a pain to have to figure out how many timers are needed in advance. So runtime allocation would be uh, really convenient. Now this might require use of the heap, but perhaps it would be limited only during initialization. Now one millisecond resolution, it might not cut it for some applications. Now the Linux kernel had the same, is same issue, and what they did is have both low resolution and high resolution timers. Higher resolution timers have more overhead, so you only use them when needed. A lot of times timers are used for guard timers and they don't really need high resolution. And finally, if you do have high resolution timers, you often need the handlers, the timer handlers, to execute immediately. So this would mean an option probably to have the callbacks occur in the interrupt context. Uh, this again is what uh, the Linux kernel has done. So this can make the software more complex. You have to worry about um, race conditions and so forth, but this might just be the price you pay for high per higher performance. So that's it for timers, and thanks again for watching.